Christos Anesti. My name is Helena Carnezos Cronus. I'm the corresponding secretary for the Hellenic Society of Constantinople and the chairperson of today's event. Today's presentation is sponsored by three organizations, the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Chicago, under the guidance of His Eminence Metropolitan Nathaniel, the Hellenic Society of Constantinople, whose president is Anna Charisiadis, and the Metrop Metropolis of Chicago Archons, Order of St. Andrew the Apostle, represented by regional commanders, Archon Gus Publicus and Archon John Manos. We welcome all of you to this 40th anniversary of the commemoration of the fall of Constantinople. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Archon website. His Grace, Bishop Timothy will lead us with the opening prayer, followed by a few words of welcome from the Archon National Commander for the Order of St. Andrew the Apostle, Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, Dr. Anthony Limbarakis. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Christos anesti et necron thanato thanatum patisas, ketis en dismimas in zoin charisamenos. Your resurrection, O Christ our Savior, enlightens the whole world and recalls thine own creation, Almighty Lord. And for this we give glory to you. Amen. I'm on behalf of his eminence, Metropolitan Nathaniel, um, I welcome you to this 40th commemoration of the fall of Constantinople. And it certainly is an honor and privilege to, to be here this afternoon with, uh, with, with all of you. Um, Helena did mention who this is sponsored by the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Chicago, the Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and the Hellenic Society of Constantinople. The panelists for today, uh, following the uh, these remarks, um, will be Archon Dr. Uh, Anthony Limberakis, who is the National Commander, Dr. Alexandros Kiru, Dr. Elizabeth Prodromo and Ms. Lena Ariri. Dr. Limberakis, would you like to offer your opening remarks? Can you hear me now, folks? Great. Uh, first of all, it's a great privilege and honor uh, a couple of weeks after Easter to talk about Hagia Sophia, the great Church of Christ, which is inextricably associated with the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the Mother Church, and the 269 archbishops of Constantinople, the 269th being His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. It's a great privilege to work with Gus Publicus and John Manus, I'll never forget being in Berlin, Germany at our second International Religious Freedom Conference when Archon Gus Publicus uh, was escorting the frail but determined Metropolitan Yakovos of blessed memory as he insisted on being at this conference. God bless you, Gus, for being there. And Archon John, it's always been a privilege to work with these two dynamic regional commanders. Professor Prodromu, a real superstar in this field, and who single-handedly, I have to say, and salute you, Elizabeth, Professor Elizabeth, by designating Turkey as a country of particular concern 
at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. If it wasn't for Professor Prodromo, that wouldn't happen. And, and now you surf, I must say, slacking off a bit. And now they're not at the worst and most egregious offender of religious freedom. So this is important because Hagia Sophia connects to the ecumenical patriarchate, connects to religious freedom, and connects to us as Orthodox in America who are under the jurisdiction of the Mother Church. I look forward to making my presentation and listening to the presentations of our co-panelists. Uh, God bless you all, and it's a great honor to be with you. Thank you, Your Grace and Dr. Limbarakis. We are very honored to have with us at today's town hall a very distinguished panel of guests. Each will offer their perspective on the 2020 conversion of Hagia Sophia from a museum to a mosque, this modern day fall of Constantinople, by drawing from their professional backgrounds and experiences. Following their presentations, we will open to you a period of Q&A where audience members can ask questions to a specific panelist. During each speaker's presentation, feel free to enter any questions you may have in the Zoom chat box feature located at the bottom of your screen. We will read as many of your questions as time permits during the Q&A. If you have not done so already, please click on the view button and then click on the speaker mode to best experience this town hall presentation. Today's town hall will begin with a historical grounding from Dr. Alexandros Kiru, professor of history from Salem State University in Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Elena. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your presence and opening remarks, Your Grace. I would like to extend my personal gratitude to the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Chicago, the Chicago Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and of course, the Hellenic Society of Constantinople, Chicago, for sponsoring this 40th commemoration of the fall of Constantinople. In particular, I would also like to thank Helena Cronus, Jeff Cronus, Amalia de la Yanis, John Manos, and Gus Publicus for their hard work and planning and organizing this event. In my brief talk today, I will address a largely ignored subject, one under the title, Turkish Mythology as National History, How and Why Turkey Commemorates the Fall of Constantinople. In our time, if one finds themselves in Istanbul on May 29, it is impossible to not be impressed, if not overwhelmed, by the massive commemorations and celebrations that take place throughout the city. Devoted to the anniversary of the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, these events include booming broadcasts of Muslim prayers at the mausoleum of Sultan Mehmet II, the conqueror of the city, the laying of wreaths at three different statues of the Sultan, continual overhead flights by squadrons of the Turkish Air Force, and an impressive ceremony outside the city walls featuring fiery speeches and Turkish soldiers colorfully dressed as Ottoman Janissaries who stage a dramatic reenactment of the moment when the ancient imposing Byzantine walls were breached following a 53-day siege. The day's celebrations are capped by a colossal pounding musical laser and fireworks show projected over the Golden Horn, during which large crowds listen to more speeches by politicians and watch scenes from the most popular film in Turkish cinematic history, Conquest 1453, projected onto giant screens and quite literally every square and public park in Istanbul. These are the most visible among a broad range of cultural, sporting, entertainment, and religious events organized on and around May 29 across Istanbul and throughout the whole of Turkey. They are massive commemorative activities reinforced by a multitude of other events and celebrations that reflect Turkish glorification of the conquest of Constantinople. The extent of the annual May 29 commemorative observances reflects the depth of importance that Turkish nationalism has invested in the conquest narrative of Constantinople. That importance has been magnified 
as Turkish nationalism has been increasingly influenced by the neo-Ottomanism championed by Turkey's current president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The Turks' commemorations and celebrations of the conquest have never been more elaborate and popular than they are today. Even Turkey's celebrations in 1953 of the 500 year anniversary of the conquest, they appear in retrospect to have been circumspect and modest compared to the gargantuan swaggering commemorations of the present. It is noteworthy that at a time in which glorification and commemoration of conquest and empire has become a source of moral discomfort, if not taboo across the world, Turkey has fully and enthusiastically integrated such celebration into its public culture and political pageantry. Why is Turkey the exception to the global rule? Instead of reveling in the world's largest state-sponsored street party, would Turkish society not be improved and elevated if such merrymaking and vulgar displays of aggression were replaced by a sober, mature, and thoughtful commemoration? One that acknowledges the mass killings, rapine, plundering, destruction, and enslavement of Greek Christians and their greatest of ancestral cities, let alone the colossal existential devastation produced by the defilement and theft of their greatest ancestral church, Hagia Sophia. These questions can be unpacked if we recognize that the way Turkey commemorates 1453 proceeds directly from the Turks' national mythology, a mythology masquerading as history. Before the rise of the Turkish nationalist movement in the late 19th century, Ottoman historical tradition understood the conquest of Constantinople. It viewed the conquest of Constantinople as a function of jihad and as the dynastic imperial supremacy of the Ottomans among the world's Muslim rulers. According to this view, the capture of Constantinople affirmed the Turks' providential role as the leaders of Islam. By the early 20th century, young Turk nationalist writers added a new dimension to this history, one aimed at promoting national pride among ethnic Turks. The new historiography emphasized Turkish more than Ottoman identity, and it emphasized national greatness more than Islamic destiny. This celebration of Turkish pride also exalted Sultan Mehmed II by imbuing him with heroic and enlightened qualities that were supposedly characteristic of the Turkish nation as a whole. Mehmed was also credited, according to this history, with transforming the Ottoman warrior state into a quote unquote, civilized society, a society that the Ottoman's successor, Mustafa Kemal, readily identified as a nation. In Republican Turkey, Kemal's state historians went to work in the interwar period, producing an official scheme of world history which posited that the ancient Turks of Central Asia were the original source of all human civilization. Folded into this mythology was a nationalist reimagining of the conquest of Constantinople now, not as only an act of jihad or as a seminal event in the history of Islam, but rather best understood as the pivotal, decisive event in world history. This narrative also emphasized that without equal, Mehmed II embodied the, virtue, the virtues of the Turkish nation and its superior development of justice tolerance, and humanity. Therefore, under Mehmed, the Turks' conquest of Constantinople marked the end of the European Christian dark Middle Ages and the beginning of a new bright modern era. 
And now under Erdogan, the Turkish state has reconciled the Ottoman and Kemalist meanings of the conquest of Constantinople by fully integrating both to produce a new, more powerful narrative. This narrative manifest in the 21st century commemorations of 1453 combines the Kemalist notions of nationalist Turkish supremacy with the Ottoman sense of entitlement to world Islamic leadership. The current commemorations of the Ottoman conquest affirm the nationalist conceit and myth that the Turkish victory in 1453 is the key positive event in world history. This view explicitly, this view explicitly refutes the long-standing notion that the fall of Constantinople was a disaster, a tragedy, a disaster for the civilized Western world. On the contrary, Turkey's popular nationalist narrative imagines that prior to 1453, the history of Christian Europe, the history of the whole of Christianity had been characterized entirely by ignorance, violence, intolerance, and cruelty. In the Turks' imagination, their conquest of Constantinople paved the way for Europe and for Christianity to escape these supposed defects and to progress along the path to religious reform, enlightenment, and ultimately the emergence of civilized societies. According to this view, the Turkish nation from its inception was a beacon of tolerance, enlightenment, and inspiring humane governance. You see, the conquest of 1453 initiated a process of cultural interchange that was essential to the progress and future of European societies, precisely because the Turks, by virtue of their conquest of Constantinople, were now in a position to civilize the barbarous and culturally inferior Christian Europeans. In short, the conquest of Constantinople was not so much an Ottoman military triumph as it was a victory for all of humankind, resulting in the spread of freedom and enlightenment throughout Europe and hence in time throughout the world. Again, and of course, it is the person of Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror who embodies these ideas. Compared to the devastation that had accompanied the Roman Catholic Crusaders sacking and occupation of Constantinople in 1204, the Sultan, according to this history, the Sultan along with his army was magnanimous and enlightened in his treatment of the people of the city whose initial panic and fear he calmed with remarkable civility and kindness. Indeed, according to this mythology, the Greeks were fortunate to have been conquered by the Turks. Mehmed not only was so gracious and tolerant as to bestow upon the Greeks their own patriarch, but he introduced freedom, equality, and enlightenment to them and their society. Therefore, you see, by conquering them, the Turks actually liberated the Greeks. They liberated the Christians from their own backwardness. So, why not then celebrate in unabashed fashion the conquest of another people's city, the world's most coveted city for nearly a millennium? And why not make memorialization of that conquest central to the Turks' national identity and sense of righteousness and global self-importance? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kiru. Our next panelist is Dr. Elizabeth Prodromo. Dr. Prodromo is a visiting associate professor of conflict resolution at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where she directs the initiative on religion, law, and diplomacy. Good evening to everyone. 
I'd like to begin by uh, reiterating the thanks expressed by Dr. Kiru to the organizers of today's event. Thank you to the, the Hellenic Society of Constantinople, the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Chicago. Thank you, Your Grace, for being with us today. The Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchy, led by Dr. Limbarakis. And thank you uh, most especially to the organizing committee, um, Helena and, and Jeff Krohns, Gas Publicus, John Manos, and Amalia Delianis. Thank you for all of your work. As I organize my, my thoughts for today, I was struck by the importance of commemoration uh, for memory, for sustainability, and for action. So I'd like to begin with a few reflection on why commemoration matters and why commemorations matter. Commemoration events are a crucial opportunity to build historical knowledge, <clears throat> to sustain historical memory in a framework that provides for continuity between the ecumenical patriarchate and Greek Orthodox Christians of the past and all those progeny and descendants of today, both inside contemporary Turkey and as part of a globalized community that shares in the history of Constantinople and in the wound and scar of the event of the fall. Commemoration events are also an opportunity to grasp other kinds of historical continuities. Specifically, the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks on May 29, 1453, introduces conquest as a, an historically uninterrupted motif in the experience of Greek Orthodox and all other Christian and non-Sunni Muslim communities under the Islamic Caliphate regime that was imposed across the lands of the Byzantine Empire, with Constantinople as the capital site of that regime, but which extended significantly to all four Eastern patriarchates, Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Constantinople of the ancient Christian Pentarchy. So conquest becomes a motif, it becomes a geographic project, and it becomes an experiential reality. Furthermore, the conquest motif introduces a historiographical project in the form of a historical narrative, some of which Dr. Kira laid out for us here, a historical narrative and a cultural heritage policy that was inaugurated with the naming of Mehmet II. After all, Mehmet II came to be known as Mehmet the Conqueror or the father of conquest, Fatih Sultan Mehmet. This Fatih moniker has informed the nationalist project since the establishment of the Turkish state in 1923, cutting across both the so-called Kemalist secular regime and now the Erdoganist Islamist regime. So the conquest or Fatih motif has also meant the weaponization of cultural heritage by the Turkish state centered on Hagia Sophia. And then finally, in terms of commemoration events and why they matter, by learning about macro history, commemoration events should be understood as an absolutely essential tool for the careful analysis and critique of knowledge production about the present and future. <clears throat> in our reality, that means knowledge production in the academic space, knowledge dissemination as information and disinformation on social, social media platforms, and historical knowledge or lack thereof that is used for purposes of political action and public policy. So from the perspective of those who are concerned about the sustainability of a living free ecumenical patriarchate and Greek Orthodox community in Turkey, now and into the future, commemoration events are about far more than folkloric box checking. They are about knowing one's own identity and history and committing to the honoring, preservation, and sustainability of intergenerationally transmitted identity across time and space. Now, in the time that remains, I want to turn to a more focused discussion of the history of the conquest motif that has defined Ottoman and eventually modern Turkish nationalism. And most specifically, I want to look at the Hagia Sophia Church of the Holy Wisdom as the most important signifier of the Turkish state's cultural heritage policy that's been used to build an exclusivist form of nationalism that marginalizes, denigrates, and eliminates 
the ecumenical patriarchate and the Greek Orthodox population as the indigenous peoples of Anatolia and Thrace. <clears throat> I'm drawing here on my own recent work, published articles, forthcoming articles, and most recently a talk that I gave at Harvard's Center for Middle Eastern Studies seminar on modern Turkey. I mentioned this for those of you who may recognize some of my comments in a moment from my work elsewhere. First of all, let me say a little bit about cultural heritage. It's a term that we hear with increasing regularity, but it's one of those terms that's sometimes vague. There's actually a, a growing legal regime that has developed over the last century plus on the definition, protection of, access to, and ownership of cultural heritage. And all of this is salient for the ecumenical patriarchate and Greek Orthodox community. Simply put, cultural heritage is evidence of the human remains of the past, which is regarded as worthy of preservation. Cultural heritage is about the past, but it's also just as much about the present and the future about how culture is embroiled in contemporary moral controversies and about what our cultural legacy will be. And I'm happy to provide citations on, on these quotes for those who are interested. Furthermore, cultural heritage is divided into two types, tangible and intangible. Tangible cultural heritage comprises remains of human existence that are material and includes movable objects such as immovable objects, excuse me, such as monuments, buildings, sites, artifacts, antiquities, paintings. Intangible cultural heritage, in contrast, and it's sometimes called living cultural heritage, falls into the domain of practices and behaviors. So it usually doesn't have a material form. It may, but not always. And it includes worship, language, music, dance, education, and other rituals and practices that actualize the identity of the human community that's associated with that intangible heritage. It's also important to point out that the establishment of a model for the definition and legal regulation of cultural heritage has moved from the origins of a legal protection regime that was focused on conditions of war and violence to broader legal protections under conditions of peace and that the specification of tangible and intangible forms of cultural heritage have been explicitly identified by international treaties and conventions, by international and multilateral institutions. They've been linked as well to the ability of human communities to actualize themselves. In other words, to sustain their memory, to own their heritage as a means of sustaining in the present and into the future who they are. And then finally, it's worth pointing out that cultural heritage is a component of this large, religious heritage, excuse me, is a component of this larger category of cultural heritage. And that protection and use of religious heritage is central to institutional religious freedom. Now, within this context, if we turn to Turkey and the Erdogan regime's reactivation of the Hagia Sophia as a mosque in July, 2020, we see that cultural heritage policy signifies the symbolic and real conquest of the former Ottoman subject peoples who since 1923 have been viewed as second class citizens in the Turkish state. The weaponization of cultural heritage stretches from the Kemalist period when Mustafa Kemal and his state makers mobilized a cross disciplinary cadre of state supported professional intellectuals. They were charged with developing a new national identity project. This was formalized in the Turkish historical thesis and it was developed in the Turkish Review of Anthropology, an academic journal that was published by the University of Istanbul's Faculty of Medicine and the Anthropology Institute of Turkey. The Turkish historical thesis used eugenics to posit the superiority of the Turkish race as masters of the country and to explain, quote, the Greeks, the Jews, and the Armenians, while living there for a long time, were the descendants of a mongrel race whose inferiority could be scientifically proven, and who, according to the Turkish Minister of Justice in the early Republic, were, quote, not genuine Turks, and therefore could have only one right in the Turkish fatherland, and that's to be servant, to be a slave. So 
Accordingly, cultural heritage policy became a weapon used to enforce this imbalance of power between master and slave, between legitimate Turks, Turkish citizens, and illegitimate servants or second-class citizens, like the non-Muslim minorities. And there's a long list of examples, but in the short time that remains, I think it's instructive to turn to the Hagia Sophia fetish as the most instructive example of the weaponization of cultural heritage. Before last summer's change of the great um, Cathedral of Hagia Sophia and the term conquest was explicitly used both by President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the head imam of the Re Director General of Foundations, the Diyane Ali Erbas, the Turkish state had converted the many Hagia Sophias of uh, the Byzantine period into mosques. That includes the uh, rest, five-year restoration of the Isnik Orhan Mosque of Hagia Sophia. That was the site of the first and seventh ecumenical councils of Christianity. Uh, the uh, Orthodox Byzantine Orthodox Church of Hagia Sophia and the black city of Trabzon was converted to a mosque. And then also the Adarne or Adrianople uh, Church of Hagia Sophia was also converted into a mosque. And just concluding here, the conquest motif has been central to these conversions. And most explicitly when Imam Ali Arabash uh, ascended the minbar or the pulpit with a sword last July to re-inaugurate Hagia Sophia's uh, reconversion into a mosque. And as he explained, Friday sermons have been delivered with a sword without interruption for 481 years. If Allah permits, we will resume this tradition from now on. This is a tradition in mosques that are the symbol of conquest. I know I'm out of time, so I'll close here, but I wanna emphasize that the conquest motif in Turkey's cultural heritage policy extends beyond the Hagia Sophia event and sites. We could discuss, if you wish, in the Q&A, the, uh, the Church of the Holy Apostles. Um, it was second in size and importance only to the Hagia Sophia. Um, it was destroyed under Mehmet the Conqueror and the Fatih Conquest Mosque was built there. He was buried next to that mosque. And there's now a sizable madrasa or Islamic school that's part of the, that, uh, that site. So the conquest motif is, has been implemented through the weaponization of cultural heritage in many sites. And it's managed by the Dianet, the Ministry of Religious Affairs, and that Dianet's resources, $2 billion, in U, $2 billion US dollars annually, quintuple the budget of the Vatican, is used both for domestic policy and for foreign policy. And again, we can talk about that in terms of Turkey's weaponization of, of cultural heritage in Turkish-occupied Cyprus, in Turkish-occupied northern Syria, and unfortunately, most recently on January 17th, one of the last acts of the outgoing US administration, signing a memorandum of understanding to quote unquote, protect Turkish cultural property, stretching back to 12,000 BC. So captivity is per being perpetuated, captivity in the form of unfreedom and second classness by the weaponization of cultural heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prodramu, for that. Ms. Lena Argiri from Greek Public Broadcasting Art is our next panelist. Thank you, Elena. Thank you all for watching. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here with you today among all these distinguished panelists. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Chicago, the Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and the Hellenic Society of uh, Constantinople for, the, for this invitation and the honor to include me in this panel in order to uh, explore how the reconversion of Hagia Sophia was covered by the media. You know, there is an old uh, saying in the media, if it bleeds, it leads. And I recalled uh, this mantra when getting ready for this session. As I reviewed the news coverage uh, over last summer's reconversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque, I was struck by the degree of under-reporting. Uh, having covered the issue with some urgency myself and reporting on the outcry from uh, UNESCO, the international community, uh, religious organizations, scholars, uh, governments around the world, and uh, uh, even common people on social media, uh, I assumed that most of the mainstream media was uh, doing so as well. But that wasn't the case, although Hagia Sophia's reconversion was a significant uh, worldwide event that carries 
uh, long-term consequences when it comes to religious uh, freedom, uh, multiculturalism, freedom of belief, and freedom of expression uh, in general. Uh, the fall of uh, Constantinople uh, certainly would have led uh, every newscast. It would have been splashed across uh, every front page. Uh, we would have learned of the number of dead, the number of refugees, about property destruction and trauma. But in the case of Hagia Sophia's reconversion, no one was hurt, no one died. And because of that, it is, it is apparent that not enough cared. So we can uh, restate the mantra I mentioned before as if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. And this is, this is the unpleasant reality when it comes uh, to the topic of our discussion today. Uh, I would like to make a distinction here between uh, the international media and the domestic Greek uh, news media, and I will, I will explain why. So uh, when it comes to international media, I would dare to say that um, with a few exceptions, they overlooked or even ignored the significance uh, of this event. When they did cover it, they did it uh, in the wider context of Erdogan's uh, expansionism, um, aggression, revisionism, or religious nationalism. They didn't uh, dig deeper. They didn't uh, try to explain or, or foresee the consequences. They just described the fact, of course, from a critical point of view, but pretty much uh, that was it. There was a, a collective failure, I would say, to explain uh, how this uh, decision uh, is affecting the whole area's historic role as a tolerant uh, metropolis where uh, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish faiths coexisted for centuries, uh, how, how it creates uh, uncertainty for religious minorities, how it can shape uh, future uh, developments, and of course, so much more. Uh, for example, I would have expected more media to have uh, uh, cited the work of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, which for years has been uh, uh, linking Turkey's treatment of cultural uh, heritage uh, as directly connected to its uh, treatment uh, of religious uh, minorities. In addition to the, um, to the under-reporting ahead of the reconversion, there has been no follow-up at all on this story from the international media. And uh, we must not forget the timing. I mean, uh, the Biden administration has put a spotlight on human rights and democracy in Turkey. Uh, US Commission on International uh, Religious uh, Freedom uh, still wrote uh, critically about Turkey's actions on Hagia Sophia and the Koran Museum. And the recognition, of course, we must not forget that of the Armenian genocide uh, actually allowed uh, everyone to recall uh, a century's worth of oppression of Turkish Christians. Even in, in light of all this, no one in the international media uh, found it um, timely to do a follow-up uh, story on Hagia Sophia. As I mentioned before, there are some exceptions. So some of those who decided to write or report, among them uh, prominent journalists and uh, prominent uh, media outlets, uh, did an exceptional job explaining and describing uh, the changes, the many changes that this uh, monument has undergone throughout its life and the ramification, uh, of course, of this, um, of this action. But generally speaking, the media coverage was limited. And this is, this is truly discouraging because we were witnessing the second conquest as Erdogan himself uh, described it, quoting a poem during his speech on July 10 last year, uh, the second captivity, as we all agree here, and the international uh, media community approached uh, the conversion as another uh, aspect of Erdogan's uh, problematic behavior. When we all know that it's more, it's more than that. So the truth is that uh, it is not an easy story to report on, as it requires a historic knowledge that most journalists lack, and also, um, I would say, a multidimensional approach that is difficult to be consumed by an international uh, audience. Uh, that is not an excuse. Uh, it is a fact, and um, that is the main reason why most of the articles you might all remember were uh, were written when were contributed by scholars, uh, professors, or experts, and not. Uh, by journalists. We must not forget also um, the timing that uh, the reconversion happened in the midst of a pandemic, uh, an election year, a polarized election year, and uh, social media, uh, social unrest in the US uh, with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. The, 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 the outlets, the media outlets, and the world itself uh, didn't even have time to pay attention. The timing was um, optimal to minimize opposition to such a draconian move, and some might argue that uh, Erdogan knew that and took advantage of it, uh, took advantage uh, of the timing. I'm not trying to argue that 
if this event uh, had been covered uh, more by the international media, things would have been different. But uh, there is no doubt that the failure to report it appropriately at the end of the day uh, benefited Erdogan. On the contrary, uh, in Greece, uh, both the conversion and the periods before and after uh, were covered extensively by all kinds of media platforms. There is this, uh, this strong sentimental bond that connects the Greeks and Hagia Sophia. So it was a development of crucial importance for the majority of the Greeks, uh, almost, I would say, without exceptions. Uh, also, the conversion was uh, perceived as, um, as a political statement on behalf of Erdogan in a period where uh, where the tensions between the two countries were extremely high. I think uh, we all remember that. And th this was another reason why the Greek news went crazy over it. It happened in the midst of, of, a, of a very difficult summer where Greece and Turkey uh, came to the brink uh, of uh, conflict. Uh, I remember myself covering the topic for months uh, before the actual July decision and weeks afterwards, uh, most as most of my Greek colleagues did. Uh, hundreds of analyses and top ads were written in the Greek newspapers at that period, all of them, of course, condemning Erdogan's decision. Uh, the Greek media uh, didn't just focus on the fact, but tried to explain in depth the long history of Hagia Sophia uh, and to educate the new generation. And in general, they tried to put the story uh, in a bigger context. Uh, they explained that um, this step will create bigger challenges for the Christian communities and this um, is indicative of Erdogan's disrespect uh, of different voices and religious sensitivities. Greek media covered um, extensively the long period that led uh, to the conversion, uh, interpreting the uh, multiple signs that were coming from Turkey and warning of course uh, of the dangers of Erdogan's uh, policies. Uh, the international um, uh, criticism was also uh, reported in detail and the Greek uh, audience's interest to be updated regularly was really, really huge. Uh, the perception in Greece was, and I would say it still is, that Erdogan will continue to do as he likes as long as uh, he doesn't face any consequence uh, uh, on the international stage. Um, the conversion was just another example of Erdogan's uh, problematic, hostile, and uh, dangerous uh, behavior that remains uh, unpunished. But um, Greek media uh, are, are targeting, you know, uh, the Greek audience, so their coverage uh, didn't contribute to any, let's say, international awakening or make uh, any difference at all. And now, and I'm concluding with that, with the dark anniversary of the fall of Constantinople approaching, uh, the first anniversary in the modern history where Hagia Sophia will be a mosque, uh, the international media will have maybe another chance to report on this conversion and explain to their audiences uh, the significance uh, of it or what has changed ever since. I think that they're unlikely to do it, at least to the extent that um, the reporting would be able to, uh, to shape uh, public opinion and serve as a platform uh, of, um, of information for the uh, international audience. I'm afraid, and I would dare to make a prediction, that uh, the upcoming anniversary will uh, unfortunately go unnoticed once again. Another opportunity lost. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Argiri. Dr. Limbarakis is our last panelist who will share with us why this event should serve to embolden our efforts to promote religious freedoms in Asia Minor. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I will uh, begin to share my screen in momentarily. Here. Okay, can you all see me okay? You see the shared screen? Someone respond, yeah. please? Yes. Thank you. Hagia Sophia, I, don't forget, Hagia Sophia was our cathedral for nearly a thousand years. It stands for 1500 years and you know, we say it stands for 1500 years. St. Nicholas that is being built at ground zero, we plan to have that stand for a thousand years as well. So keep that in mind. It'll be our Hagia Sophia and Ecumenical Patriarchate and Parthenon in New York City. Barakato. Uh, 
Oh, let's see here. Okay. The conversion of Hagia Sophia was catastrophic. It was symbolic. It affected people around the world. His all holiness, in his words, stated, instead of uniting a 1,500-year-old heritage, it's dividing us. I am saddened and shaken. The exarch in America, Archbishop Elpidio Foros, in his words, even during the centuries of the Ottoman period, the power of Hagia Sophia, although now used as an Islamic shrine, was unmistakable and unmistakably Christian. Now, this is a person who spent his entire ecclesiastical life at the Fanar, as a deacon, as a priest, as a monk priest, as a bishop, as a metropolitan. And his, and the Hagia Sophia that he's talking about was around the corner for where, from where he grew up. Metropolitan Nathaniel, who can't be with us today, stated, we are troubled by the government's disregard for religious pluralism in Turkey. And we are particularly concerned because this action represents a visible marginalization and continued attack of the religious freedom of Turkey's Christian communities and other religious minorities. You know, the Archons have been going to Turkey and we've met with Erdogan, we've met with numerous ministers bringing these issues up time and time again. You know, we all say that Hagia Sophia is a world heritage site by UNESCO. Well, what, what does that mean exactly? We looked it up and it's, it's an unbelievable recognition of one of the few creations of humankind that serves as evidence of our intellectual history on the planet, according to UNESCO, a remarkable accomplishment of humanity. That's Hagia Sophia. What is it today? It's a bit different than what it was. These are shields that we'll talk about a little bit later. The New York Times characterize it as a structure of surpassing beauty with a deep overlay of the histories of East and West Christianity and Islam. You know, it was built 1500 years ago. 10,000 workers by order of Emperor Justinian had it built. The Justinian cross which adorned the dome and multiple areas throughout the church is no longer seen. Instead, we see this. The great shields of, in, written in Arabic carrying the names of Muhammad, not Jesus Christ, and the conquering, emphasis word, emphasized word, conquering caliphs of Islam. They celebrate the fact that Hagia Sophia was taken by force of arms and is a war trophy. Words really repeated time and time by Erdogan. To us, they represent religious oppression and memoricide. The iconography that's noted throughout the church, including the, the deistic icon, just extraordinary examples. And here we have the last group of American pilgrims led by Archbishop Bilby the Foros to go to Istanbul, Constantinople and be present in Hagia Sophia. This was the last group led by the Archbishop. We see Archon Peter Skiatis uh, and other Archons, some from Chicago as well. And you're very lucky to have made it just under the skin under the line before it became a mosque. But now, what is it? It's not a museum. 
This is what's happened. The platitera of the Theotokos covered. This is a despicable act of cultural memoricide. And this is an area of expertise of Professor Prodromu. This is what's going on at Hagia Sophia now. The icons are covered. And this is what we hear. Thousand, and see thousands of Islamists gathering outside Hagia Sophia, going inside Hagia Sophia. This was the great church of Christ for a thousand years, the largest cathedral served by metropolitans, priests by the hundreds, deacons. And this is what's going on today. Erdogan is the center here. I've had enough. This is a systemic process. It's been ongoing. You know, Erdogan was calling for the conversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque a decade ago, as were many of his ministers. And it's not only Hagia Sophia, it's Simonitis Chora, the beautiful Church of the Holy Savior, Savior that has unbelievable iconography. And I have to tell you, one of my favorites is the mosaic of the nativity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you will see, and my pointer isn't showing right now, but you will see if you look at the feet of Panagia, there's a rope across the feet and ankles. And that rope is symbolic of the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior. You don't see that icon at many places. And I was struck by its beauty and its symbolism uh, at the Monitus Coras. Before pictures, after pictures, everything is obliterated, everything is covered. Nicaea where the Christian creed, the Constantinopolitan creed, not only used by Orthodox, but by our brother Catholics and Protestants, all Christians use the Nicene Creed. And this was where it was established. And this was the museum, and now it's a mosque, a functioning mosque. Trapezon was a, a tremendous an ex example of Byzantine architecture. Again, eight years ago, it was converted to a mosque from a neutral museum, neutral museum. One thing I'm very proud that the Archons have been doing over the years is education, engagement, meetings. You know, one of our uh, Athena Goras Human Rights Award recipients, Jay Seculo, mentioned a, a concept called the Ministry of Engage, the Ministry of Presence, the Ministry of Presence. That means you have to show up in Washington, in the states throughout the United States, at the European Union, at the European Court of Human Rights, in Ankara, in the capital cities of the EU, where archons have been going for a couple of decades, you have to show up and you have to educate. And a great uh, tool to educate, and I salute our good friend and archon Rocky Sisson of Washington, D.C., now formerly of Arizona, of creating these Hagia Sophia cards, which is a, a hand-sized card 
as you can see, that you should do, that that are available by the thousands at our Archon office. And I invite all the Sunday school classes and interested parishioners to have a few of these cards in them. So when people talk about religious persecution and the, 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 the plight of the ecumenical patriarchate, you can give them a card. It's a great teaching tool. So in, in, as I conclude, my, my thoughts here, and, and they were to give you a visual picture of the magnificence of the great church of Christ and what Erdogan and the Turkish government has done in terms of memoricide and destruction uh, of our heritage uh, is concluding. And I wanna thank the, the metropolis of Chicago, His Eminence, the uh, Metropolitan, the Metropolitans, uh, the Metropolis of Chicago Archons, under the great leadership of Regional Commanders Gus Publicus and John Manos, and of course the Hellenic Society of Constantinople. But if you would allow me a moment of personal privilege, I want to share with you perhaps the most one of the most significant milestone achievements of the Order of St. Andrew. And that is the establishment of the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew Foundation for the Sacred Sea of St. Andrew. What this is, my beloved friends, is um, an instrument to provide for the financial well-being of the Mother Church. When it comes to economics, unfortunately, our Mother Church is somewhat orphaned. But the order established this foundation to ensure in perpetuity that the worldwide ministry of the ecumenical patriarchate will continue without concern for economic funding. One of the achievements and one of the categories of giving, and I have to salute Metropolitan Nathaniel of Chicago for committing to be a founding member. Now, what is a founding member? A founding member commits $100,000 to the foundation. It's a, it's a sacrifice, it's a stretch gift for many, many people, and yet they're coming because they wanna directly benefit the mother church under difficult circumstances. And you know, in the metropolis of Chicago, six founding members have, uh, have uh, declared themselves, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bueller, uh, Tom Kappas, uh, Bill Dukas, Gus and Gail Publicus, Archon Periclesiatus, Archon Bill and Tiki Spell, who just sponsored a wonderful wine uh, reception for the Archons, and our great friend and respected intellect, Ted and Anne Theophilus. But you know, in the past week, believe it or not, another six adding to the seven, another six founding members from the metropolis of Chicago de uh, declared themselves. They include Nick and Marcy Alexos, Harold and Georgia Anagnos, John and May Calamos, and finally a father and his two sons each became founders, and that's James and Lillian Thomas, Drs. Gregory and Virginia Thomas, and James and Denise Thomas. These are sacrificial gifts to ensure the financial well being of the ecumenical patriarchate, the Mother Church. And what does, what does Hagia Sophia mean to His All Holiness? I want to conclude by quoting what he said after 9 11. Notice the date of this inscription that is written in his own hand. September 2001, we pray that the mystical light of the great church illumine all the world so that it may live in peace and justice according to the will of almighty God. Const uh, the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. Thank you very much for your kind attention and I yield the rest of my time to the panel. 
Thank you, Dr. Limbarakis. We extend our great thanks to each of these speakers for joining us today. At this point, the Metropolis of Chicago Archon Regional Commanders, Gus Publicus and John Manos will open the town hall meeting to the questions from the viewers. Thank you, Elena, and a very big thank you to all of our esteemed panelists for their presentation today. At this point, we'll begin our Q&A session for the panelists. We have about 20 minutes or so to ask whatever questions you have. I ask that you please go to the lower section of your Zoom screen where you see the chat box. Please type your questions and also type for which panelists your question should be directed to or leave it blank and we'll ask the panelists all at once. Uh, can I start? Please, Gus. Yeah. Great presentation. Uh, first question is to uh, National Archon Commander, Dr. Limbarakis. Doctor, great presentation. Um, question came in. Compared to the last five years or five years ago, how has the American policy really changed? The same question with, with Turkey. Has their policy really changed? Well, uh, I, I think the policy has changed and things are different. I think the actions of Erdogan specifically as a NATO country, I say NATO in quotations, you, you recall that Erdogan purchased the S-400 missile defense system from Russia, from, the, you know, from Russia, not a NATO country. Of course, our F-35s were then banned to go to Turkey. So the actions of Erdogan himself has made the climate in Congress and uh, on the Hill, the State Department and the White House much more hostile. Um, in the past, typically uh, we'd have difficulty convincing uh, senators and members of Congress that human rights is, accounts, human rights is important. Uh, as I said earlier, Professor Prodromu uh, convinced you, sir, United States Commission on International Religious Freedom to designate Turkey at the worst level of uh, religious freedom violators, a country of particular concern. Since she's left, they've downgraded it. At one time, they made it normal, and now they have it at the second worst level, despite, despite the conversion of Hagia Sophia as a provocative in your face move showing religious intolerance rather than religious tolerance. One good thing that we have going for us is one, the personal relationship of President Biden with the ecumenical patriarch. You know, President Biden as sitting vice president, no one's ever done that before, as sitting vice president, went to the Fanar and met twice with his all holiness. It was a privilege to witness that. And, and the president and the now president has said, and just most recently, a few weeks ago said that he considers this man uh, Christ-like in his uh, ministry on earth. So the relationship between Biden and the ecumenical patriarch is important. The changing relationship of Congress, which is more hostile to towards Turkey because of their actions against NATO and their actions against NATO countries, Greece and Cyprus. So I think it's, it's changing. And the last thing I think that's gonna kind of tip the scale in our favor is the incumbent visit of the ecumenical patriarch to Washington and the United States in October of this year. God willing, he'll be there personally. I know there are massive campaigns going on behind the scenes, notifying uh, members of Congress, Senate, uh, Re House of Representatives, Congressmen, Congresswomen, Congresspersons, if you will, uh, the State Department, a lot of activity gearing up to the personal uh, a presence and visitation of the ecumenical patriarch, which will focus attention, the world's attention on not only the ministry of his all holiness, the longest serving ecumenical patriarch in history, 30 years, no one's ever done that since the beginning, since St. Andrew, no one's done that, I repeat that, so it's extraordinary. 
but it's a changing environment and his presence will draw f- attention to that. And the last thing, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the, Wa- the Washington Post and the New York Times did have a number of articles on, on uh, the conversion of Hagia Sophia. And especially the New York Times had an extraordinary videotape that you could find on our website that showed the security guards of Erdogan beating up in Washington, D.C., in front of the Turkish embassy, peaceful American citizens protesting against Turkey and their religious freedom uh, constraints. And we have that uh, video. So that was the New York Times piece, and they did a great job with that. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liberakis. Uh, the next question is by Archon Dr. Nicholas Lucian. Is it not true that the Church of the Holy Apostles was in a state of disrepair, as reported by many historians, and under the premise, these historians claim that it was torn down? And that's for any of the panelists that may know that. Okay. Anybody want to take that question? Well, let's move on, John. Well, I can. I, I'd like to say one thing on that. Uh, an interesting factoid on the Church of the Holy Apostles. If you go to Venice, the Church of St. Mark is a replica of the Church of the Holy Apostles of Constantinople. So if you want to see a replica of the Church of the Holy Apostles, go to St. Mark's in Venice. It's a magnificent, extraordinary uh, cathedral. Okay, well, let's move on to another question. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, to um, uh, Dr. Kiru, um, a question for you, if I may, please. Could you please tell us something about how the fall of Constantinople was publicly commemorated during the time of the Ottoman Empire? Uh, thank you for, for the question, Gus. It was commemorated in an altogether different way than it is celebrated today. As I mentioned in my uh, brief talk, it was understood for the greater part of Turkish, certainly all the whole part, except for the last decades of Ottoman history, as cause for celebrating a religious driven conquest. It was understood as a triumph of jihad. It was understood as a marking moment in the supremacy, demonstrated supremacy of the Ottoman dynasty in the Islamic world. Uh, celebrations beginning in 1454 with Mehmed II himself were largely limited to members of three communities, uh, the dynastic family itself, uh, members of the Ilmiye, that is the elite religious establishment uh, within uh, Ottoman Islam, and finally the most elite members of the Osmanlı class, that is the highest rungs of the state administration. Uh, the, 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 there was no public celebration until the latter part of the 19th century. And even then those celebrations were modest. The first large scale celebration that takes place commemorating the fall of Constantinople is one that's inspired largely by the young Turks two years after their so-called 1908 revolution. In 1910, the young Turks having enlisted the support of the remnants of the Osman Lidir, the traditional Ottoman ruling class, and the uh, religious establishment in Istanbul staged a very large nationalist driven commemoration of the fall. Uh, that was repeated in 1911. In 1912, of course, it was disrupted as it was in 1913 by what for the Turks was the catastrophe of the Balkan Wars. Those celebrations were more or less used to promote martial mobilization during the First World War. And they fell into, uh, they, they, they became less attended, uh, less supported by the state in the early Kemalist period, only to be revived after Kemal in, beginning in 1953 and gaining momentum and bringing us to the current moment. So the way that commemoration has taken place the way it's been celebrated 
<clears throat> has directly reflected the state's needs and interests at a given time in Ottoman and in Turkish history. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, thank you. The next question is for Dr. Bordromo. Can you remark on how the case of Pastor Brunson altered perception of Turkey and why the concern of mainstream Christians in the US was limited to that case and not to broader treatment of Christian minorities in Turkey? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, I, and because I think it's very important, although on the one hand, uh, the imprisonment, the protracted detention and then imprisonment of Pastor Brunson certainly raised the profile of religious freedom violations in Turkey against Christian communities, but more generally. Uh, I think that, um, and it activated certainly um, institutions of the US government uh, in order to secure Pastor Brunson's release. Uh, I think the, the lost opportunity there was that um, the focus was simply on the Pastor Brunson case. And as he himself um, would say, um, he's simply one victim of a broader pattern when it comes to the impunity of the Turkish state against Christian communities in Turkey. And also what are considered non-conforming Muslim communities in Turkey, for example, the Alawites. Um, I think that ultimately the decision to focus only on the Pastor Brunson episode uh, was a, a political decision, uh, but I also think it's important to recognize that it speaks to the um, deficits and the weaknesses and what I would say an, is an, the need for an ecumenical voice when it comes to um, the predations and the privations that the Christian community suffer in Turkey. Um, so I think in that regard, uh, there's a lot of work to be done so that the evangelical Christian community which really pushed hard on Pastor Andrew Brunson's release, would understand that what Pastor Brunson experienced is unfortunately the, um, the consequence of a policy of appeasement that's been practiced by the United States government oh. for a century now, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, all men or all, all form of Turkish uh, administrations, whether self-defined secularist or now religious. So, if things continue uh, in, this, in this trajectory, what the Greek Orthodox community and the other ancient Christian communities of Turkey have suffered and continue to suffer um, will be what other communities in Turkey uh, suffer. And we're seeing that not only with evangelical Christians, but we're seeing it also with the Jewish community, which um, is in the crosshairs of the Turkish state's um, weaponization of cultural heritage uh, and um, toleration for acts of violence against that community. And that community is exiting Turkey because of uh, the insecurity that they suffer. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. You know, we're getting uh, several messages on the Ayo Sophia card, which, which is encouraging to see. They're asking again how they can obtain uh, copies of those cards. So we remind our audience again that uh, feel free, please, to call the Metropolis of Chicago and refer the call to the Archons here locally, and we will make sure that we get you as many cards as you like. So thank you for that inquiry. You'll be very impressed with, the, with, the, with what you see. Uh, the next question I see is, is going to Ms. Elena Ayiri. Um, question is, is uh, how did the Turkish media cover the reconversion of Ayo Sophia? Thank you for this uh, question. So uh, in Turkey, generally speaking, uh, the overall reactions were unsurprisingly positive. The popul population there, uh, I would dare to say in its majority approved and applauded the, the conversion. You know, uh, it brought back memories of the Ottoman past. And that sentiment uh, was reflected uh, not only in the Turkish media, but also on the social media platforms like Twitter, where uh, millions of users from Turkey were celebrating openly for days. Uh, many perceived this decision as a symbolic action of renewed imperial power, uh, others as another victory. One problematic aspect of this perception was that uh, many Twitter users, and I'm not referring to the, to the so-called bots, uh, fake users, I mean, but uh, to actual users with thousands of followers, uh, 
uh, were using words like conquest, battle, uh, dominance, supremacy, when they were expressing their opinion about the conversion. Some, uh, of course, there were some Turkish users um, that said that this world heritage should have remained as it was with a neutral character, and some others recognized that Erdogan uh, was using Hagia Sophia um, to distract the voters from the dire economic situation and, you know, to divert attention from the collapsing economy. But overall, uh, generally speaking, the coverage in Turkey was uh, biased in favor of the reconversion and uh, very positive for Erdogan. So we can say that, uh, you know, he offered his domestic audience exactly uh, what it needed, uh, what it wanted. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Argiri. Uh, we have the next question for Dr. Kiru. The 1953 500th anniversary commemoration was planned 10 years before so that no Greek will remain in Turkey. Isn't that the final push of ultimate ethnic cleansing? Dr. Guido? Uh, I'm not quite sure how to interpret the, the question in terms of a 10 year plan. There's been a so called Eretmi Programmi in place in Turkey uh, since essentially the signing of the Treaty of Luzon, which guaranteed and legalized uh, through international treaty protections for uh, minority officially recognized minority communities such as the Greek Orthodox, Armenian, and Jewish communities in Turkey. The Eretmi Programmi, however, was a program initiated uh, secretly by the Turkish authorities aimed at the complete and total elimination steadily uh, uh, across time. Uh, and we're now, of course, nearing the perhaps successful completion of that Turkish project. Uh, the 1953 celebrations were peculiar in the, the sense that, like in so many instances from, 19, well, from the Ottoman period to the present, the leaders of the Greek, Armenian, and Turkish communities were coerced into public participation and eulogizing over the conquest uh, so that uh, community, uh, both religious and secular leaders, of the then very large Greek population in Constantinople and Istanbul were effectively forced into the public humiliation of celebrating the fall of Constantinople in 1953. I mention that precisely because public and private humiliations are a component of the Eretmi Programmi, which is literally means, if I understand correctly, of the annihilation uh, program. I hope that at least addresses, if not answers, the question that was posed. Well, if I may, it, it does, doctor. And there's a follow-up question that, that we need to ask here. It's, and it's directed to you, if you would, please. And it, it is, what first sparked your interest in this subject? Do you have a personal connection to Constantinople? Uh, I, I do not have, if by personal one means a family connection, I have no such connection. Um, However, uh, family and things personal uh, did first spark my interest, and that's certainly not in Constantinople or the uh, ancestral uh, Greek place that is Constant Constantinople and uh, uh, its crowning achievement of Hagia Sophia. As, as it happens, uh, quite literally 20 years ago, I found myself with my family, my wife Elizabeth and our, our daughter Sophia, who then at the time was only three years old. Uh, visiting Constantinople. And in fact, we were going to be going to the Fanar uh, to be received by the His Holiness, His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch, Bartholomew. Uh, we had arrived uh, into the city, and this was my first trip uh, to Constantinople, to Istanbul, uh, in, uh, in, in spring. Uh, we went to sleep because we were exhausted from a very arduous trip. I woke up before my wife and daughter did. I was completely disoriented by jet lag. I couldn't find anything to do to occupy the time, so I turned on the television in our hotel room. And I found myself drawn to a peculiar program. It was a children's program. I don't speak Turkish. I don't understand Turkish. So many of the talk shows and, and television uh, news programs around the time were beyond my comprehension. But I found myself drawn to something that was accessible, and I understood, and that was a children's cartoon. And it was a cartoon depicting the conquest of Constantinople in 1453. And then it occurred to me, 
that morning. Well, now I understand why the city was covered with Turkish flags when we arrived. We had arrived on the afternoon of May the 28th. I woke up on May the 29th and everything on Turkish television was dedicated to the fall of Constantinople. And I was particularly drawn to and troubled by what I saw in this child's program, which depicted the emperor Constantine XI, the Greek population, in the most unsettling of ways. They were caricatured in likenesses which were virtually identical to the way that Nazis depicted Jews in Germany and Europe in the 1930s. These racialized profiles of degenerate individuals who were portrayed, and I could follow this because it was a program intended for children, they were portrayed as occupiers of a city in which a hard-pressed native Turkish population awaited liberation. And so that population was freed by a courageous figure that being Sultan Mehmet II. Uh, this was a half hour long program. I was enthralled by it and I was deeply troubled by it in terms of what kind of message it was intended to convey to innocent young Turkish children. That's what first sparked my interest in how and why Turks commemorate the fall of Constantinople as they do today. Thank you, certainly, certainly understood. We have several, several more questions coming in. Uh, Gus, we have time for one more. Uh, would you please go ahead with that? This is to Dr. Podromo. How, how do you see the current bill of the Turkey and Ecumenical Patriarchate Religious Freedom Act 2021 affecting any change? If you're talking about the bill that was co-sponsored um, by um, Carolyn Maloney and Gus Bilirakis, um, congressional officials, um, I, I think it's a step in the right direction. I, I, I think that the goal should be um, CPC designation, country of particular concern designation for Turkey. Um, Turkey meets that legal threshold. I, it's far beyond the watch list threshold. I think the most important thing about that bill is that it makes a, a, a request that the White House um, provide an explanation for a failure to designate Turkey as a watchless country, but Turkey has been designated a watchless country. Um, so I think that the focus, if there's an opportunity to uh, do more, it may be on um, asking for CPC designation and then also an explanation for why no CPC designation. Uh, Turkey rises to and well beyond the legal threshold for egregious and systematic violations of religious freedom. I think one of the things that's important in this discussion is that um, we need to move beyond understanding systematic and egregious as something that's associated with constant active violence. Because what this Turkish state has done quite successfully uh, over the last 100 years is beyond the episodic violence of pogroms, and uh, episodes of localized violence is that the Turkish state has used a series of suffocating interlocking laws to make it impossible for uh, minority communities. And when I use the term minority, I simply mean demographic minorities. These are indigenous communities, but that's made it impossible for these communities to do simple things like access their, uh, their collective or their individual uh, sites to refurbish those sites, uh, to utilize them without the permission of local authorities, uh, to sell their property, to uh, transfer their property. And this is all under the guise, of course, of, of law. I mean, these are laws which have been passed, but they occur without violence. And so what we're seeing in Turkey, as we see in other parts of the region, and unfortunately, as we've seen in the United States and in other parts of the you know, democratic um, European world is the use of legislation to make it impossible for certain communities to, to practice their rights. I saw in the chat a question about Native Americans in the United States and Father Justin, I think you asked that question. There's a really tremendous uh, recent article, it's long, but it's worth reading in the Harvard Law Review that deals with case, recent case law regarding uh, Native Americans and the protection of what remains of their own um, sacred sites in this country. Um, and it speaks again to certainly a post-genocide reality 
but to a reality in which there's no longer violence, but um, the preservation of those sites and access to them is what's going to allow what's left of the indigenous communities in this country to sustain themselves. So the Turkish case is very, very important because it's illustrative of a broader global phenomenon. And the fact that Turkey is a NATO member state, an EU candidate country belonging to NATO that's meant to be a community of democratic values and a community, a collective security arrangement. And Turkey acts with this kind of impunity when it comes to religious freedom, human rights more broadly, and cultural heritage. Um, it's, it signals to the rest of the world that um, that rule of law is something that is a fiction. And certainly when the United States, where the US is concerned, this is now an opportunity for the US to elevate human rights and cultural heritage protection as part of that. And I hope that's gonna happen. And I hope that legislation uh, will, will enable that. Thank you, Dr. Bodromo. And again, thank you everyone. Thank you to all the panelists. Our websites uh, are listed up on our uh, screen here as soon as we finish again. If there's any other information you would like, please, please feel free to uh, get on any of those and contact us with any additional uh, questions. Archon Regional Commander Gus Publicas will offer our closing remarks for the symposium at this time. That concludes our 2021 program commemorating the fall of Constantinople. On behalf of Metropolitan Nathaniel of Chicago, the Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and the Hellenic Society of Constantinople, we want to thank our esteemed and distinguished panelists for taking the time to share their views and providing us interesting discussion related to Hagia Sophia. We also need to thank the devoted stewards of our church who helped put on this production. And last but not least, we thank you, our audience, for tuning in today and allowing us the privilege of your company. So we hope you enjoy today's presentation. For the past 40 years of Metropolis, the Archons, the Hellenic Society have commemorated the fall of Constantinople. So please watch for our 2022 presentation coming next May. To learn more about the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Chicago, the Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and the Hellenic Society of Constantinople, please check out the websites displayed on your screen. Once again, thank you and Christos Anesti.